Okay. All right. Well, let's get started. Um, thank you for coming to the first of three classification talks for the statistical learning group. We're in a different environment now, a lot more official. I feel like we should be talking about stocks and stock options and portfolios and stuff in here. Um, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, my talk, I called it Redfish, Bluefish. Uh, because it's all about classification. It's a survey of supervised classification methods. Um, and uh, yeah, my name is Neil Grantham, and today is October the 17th, 2014 AD. Uh, and just to start off, uh, some slug logistics. Let's thank Brian Gaines, Josh Day, and Will Burton for their great talks on regularization and penalization. Those are really nice. Started it off right. Um, and reminder, slides, code, and video is on Justin Post's website, so go on there you know, relive the magic. And uh, so today is the first of our three-part classification mini-series. Um, on the horizon after today, when you're super jazzed on supervised classification, um, Suchit is going to give, be giving a talk on Bayesian classification methods. And lucky for you, we don't have anybody for October 31st. So when you're all kind of pumped up, you got adrenaline going afterward, shoot me an email we can figure something out for that last talk. So there's a lot of material here, and uh, I think that's, you're going to get a good idea of that after this talk. So it's really, really, really flexible. There's a chair up here also for anybody. Um, yeah, and that's Halloween. So you, know, you can work in some like spooky puns and all that crap. Um, OK, so here's the outline. I'm going to talk about why classification. I'm going to give you a brief notation. It's really straightforward, nothing magical or anything like that. I'm going to talk about the two cultures. That'll make sense in a little bit. And I'm going to talk about different data models for classification. And then I'm going to talk about algorithmic models for classification. And then just the one slide summary on what I talked about. So uh, why classification? That's a good question. My answer is we're born to classify. So I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I thought this was super clever. One fish, two fish, that's regression. Redfish, bluefish, that's classification. So I consider Dr. Seuss my first supervised learning textbook author. Um, <laughs> I actually brought a copy here for show and tell. <laughs> so if somebody's trying to classify my library book, check out history, it's going to be really weird because it's going to be all about clustering binary data and then one fish, two fish, redfish, bluefish from the library. Um, but anyway, no, so we're born to classify. Human beings are natural classifiers. Um, if you were a hunter-gatherer and you couldn't classify what and what was not a predator, you would be quickly weeded out of the gene pool. So it's something that we've kind of been bred to do, especially when you're a child. Oh, that's dad, that's mom, right? Don't get them confused because they'll get upset at you. You know, and then it's food. You got to classify. We're just natural classifiers. Uh, so examples of supervised classification has really come a long way. Um, I mean, there's automatic speech recognition when you tell Siri, like, Hey Siri, I'm running out of gas. Where is the nearest gas station? It recognizes those words, classifies them as, oh, I think they're talking about buying more gas, and then brings you up the, you know, the most the closest places. There's also natural language processing, which is like Google Translate. And the big thing now in natural language processing, I'm by no means a natural language processing expert, so when I say big thing, it was just one of the things that popped up. Um, yeah, part of speech tagging and sy syntactic parsing. So that's not only are you looking at word frequency in which words are being used in text, you're looking at how they relate to each other, and when this word is followed by this word, and what, you know, what conjugation of the verbs do you have? Are you talking past tense, present tense? Are you commanding somebody to do something? So that's part of speech tagging and syntactic parsing. Again, that's classification. You have to classify you know, what verb tense it is, where the different words fit into the, the scheme. Obviously, a really cool one is image classification. I mean, facial recognition software, Facebook, He's doing that, probably um, NSA is pretty good at that, um, which is kind of frightening. Um, another thing that you need to be able to do, um, if you've got self-driving cars, you can't just be keep driving and then not pay attention to anything. Um, self-driving cars have to have some sort of image classification system when they run into different traffic signs. This is a stop sign, not like a hit the pedal to the metal sign. You know, that, that would be catastrophic. Um, another thing that they've been doing is they're using uh, image classification on brain tumors to, f to figure out, okay, what's given a set of samples that this is, a, this is what a malignant tumor looks like, this is what a benign tumor looks like, and you got a bunch of samples on that. I want to be able to look at a new image and just immediately give some sort of quick classification on should we worry about it or should we not worry about it? Is it um, malignant or is it benign? And then um, some other 
possibilities. I mean, there's tons. Uh, just some sort of like, uh, if you're looking at your consumers or your customers, uh, you look at demogra demographics, you want to classify somebody as a young 20-something with not a lot of expendable income versus, you know, uh, I don't know, some new young professional with a lot of money to blow on our product, right? You would want to know those things because that's really important to your business. And then also the Amazon um, system, customers who bought this item also bought dot, dot, dot. They're, it's, you're classifying what should be in your shopping cart. So supervised classification is, is everywhere. Uh, you could easily have you know, 12 more slides of this stuff, but I only have one. Um, all right, so just some quick notation before we get into things. It's really straightforward. I pretty much just copied Brian's notation because uh, <laughs> it was easy enough. Um, so why I is our output, our response variable. In this case, it's categorical because we're classifying stuff. We're not drawing some sort of quantitative numerical uh, relationship here. And the sample size is I from 1 to N. And then we've got input variables or predictors, which they may be continuous. They may be um, categorical. And that's uh, X, I, J, and then J goes from 1 all the way up to P. So we've got P possible predictors. So in certain situations in this talk, I'm going to have P equals 1. I might have P equals 2, just to illustrate the concepts. But ideally, you would have a lot of predictors, so P would be large, so that you'd be able to tease out the best possible classification. And then just some ma quick matrix notation. Um, a bold Y is just going to be a vector, uh, N by 1 column vector of the Ys. And when I say this big X, um, we're talking about a matrix with each of the rows is the, uh, the values of the input or predictor variables um, with N rows, the number of observations, and P columns, the number of uh, predictors. And so the special part about our classification talk is that um, you might have any number of possible classes. So maybe something is spam or not spam. In that case, you would have K, uh, big K equaling 2. And I might refer to the two classes little k equal 1 and little k equal 2. Um, you can imagine a situation where you might have, you're trying to classify multiple different um, observations into different categories, in that, which case K would be large. So usually con the convention is that if K equals 2, uh, Y is then binary, and we'll say it takes values 0 or 1. You might also see negative 1 and 1. It really doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Um, some methods use either one just because it makes the math a little bit nicer. Um, but then consistently, if K is greater than 2, we just say that Y takes values 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to K. Um, so uh, before we get into classification talks, I think it's important to talk about the two cultures because we haven't really talked about it. And when I mean two cultures, um, there's a big paper by uh, Bremen, Bremen, I probably mispronouncing, Leo Bremen. He's at, uh, he's at UC Berkeley. And he published a paper in 2001 called Statistical Modeling the Two Cultures. And what he gets at here is that there's two primary um, sets of research that statisticians are working in. And the one that we in this room are most familiar with is the data modeling. And what you are assuming is that given some sort of uh, input variables x, you assume that the data are generated in some knowable way, whether it's from some sort of normal distribution or whether it's Poisson or something like that. You are assuming that the data that you are seeing are generated from some sort of st stochastic data model, in which case if you wanted to predict y, well, if your data are generated in this way, then it's just a matter of running, taking your x, running some sort of linear regression or logistic regression or Cox model, and then predicting the y. Because if your data are truly generated in that fashion, then it's just a matter of modeling it with the appropriate tool. So uh, I mean, obviously, this is 2001, so that's a, you know, 13 years ago. But um, Breiman says that the probably about as that 2001, like 98% of statisticians, he says, falls into the data modeling category. Like that's mostly what we're doing. This is, you know, you're getting parameter estimates, um, and you're imposing your assumption on the how the data are generated. Whether or not that's true or not is, you know, up to interpretation. Um, and the other one, which he said is popular outside of statistics, and he see, he said he was seeing about 2% of statisticians working on, is what's called algorithmic modeling, and that holds that this. Uh, how the data are actually created is unknown and probably super complex. And so rather than filling in the black box with some sort of knowable model, you just keep it as a black box. You don't know 
how you are getting y from x. However, you have these nice algorithmic tools, such as decision trees or neural nets, where you can circumvent this unknowable black box and then still get predictions about y. So it's basically the two cultures are kind of two different ways that you're getting at predictions. Um, and this is not just for classification, it's just we hadn't talked about it before. So uh, this comes up in classification, obviously, and I've divided my talk between data models and algorithmic models. And I would, s at least from what I've seen, algorithmic models are definitely the ones that everybody's using nowadays. If your sole purpose is prediction, then you're probably using an algorithmic model. But if you, for example, for the data model, you can make inference on the parameters of your model. So you could say something to the effect of, well, when I look at some sort of brain tumor, the most important variables in predicting whether or not it's malignant or benign is, you know, the radius of the tumor or the thickness or its growth rate or something like that. I would be able to, pr to point out in a data model what variables are best predictors of the status of my tumor. You're not going to get that with algorithmic model. You're just going to get really good predictions on whether or not something is benign or malignant. So there's two different reasons that you would use these two different models, but you should be aware of both. And I, I think his main point in this article is people are putting themselves in one camp and not looking at the other one. And this one has definitely taken off non-statistician, in non-statistician world, definitely some sort of computer science. Um, there, I mean, a lot of them involve heavy computation. So it's really attractive to non-statisticians who don't need to say, assume the data are generated, normal, zero, blah, 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 right? You don't need to do that with the algorithmic modeling section. 